It has pleasure to have you here. Let me introduce the participants. Unfortunately, Mr. Ambassador John Herbs could not attend due to the change in his schedule at the last moment. Ambassador Mr. Fatih Ceylan, retired former Turkish permanent representative to NATO between 2013-2018. Brigadier General Mr. Mark Kimit, USA retired former Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, USA Department of State. Associate Professor Mr. Michael Reynolds, Near Eastern Studies and Director of the Program in Russian, East Eurasian and Eurasian Studies at Princeton University. And Dr. Mr. Fariz Ismail Zadeh, Executive Vice Rector at Ada University in Azerbaijan. Dr. Mr. Jeffrey Mankov, Distinguished Research Fellow at the USA National Defense University Institute for National Strategic Studies. The purpose of this panel is to discuss the future of the USA-Turkey relations and the influence of Russia, and of course, to find some possible solutions. We plan the panel in three parts. Each session will be 30 minutes. In each session, I would like to ask each of you one question. I will be very happy if you could answer each question in five minutes at the most. Now, let me pose the first question to you, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Jaylan. Yeah. Turkey and USA had extensive relations at all levels on bilateral, regional, and global issues. However, tensions have been rising between the two countries in recent years. According to USA and NATO officials, Turkey is an important NATO ally and a crit critical regional partner. Turkey has been a North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO ally, since 1952 as well. Turkey is also an important security partner of USA in the region. Isn't the aim to keep Turkey connected to Europe Atlantic community? If this is the case, what do you think, sir, about the USA policies towards Turkey or vice versa? Thank you for that question. Let me uh, express my uh, gratitude to Istanbul Aydın University uh, for organizing this webinar. Uh, and my, my thanks also go to uh, uh, National Security and Strategy Research Center and certainly to you, uh, Dr. Babirolu, uh, whom, I had welcome, the sir. whom I had the privilege of meeting when I was in Brussels for my second term uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and you were an officer at SHAPE uh, headquarters. I do remember you very well. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very uh, much. I mean, it's true that Turkey has been uh, a member of, Tur of, of NATO since 1952. Uh, for decades. And when we look throughout that membership period, uh, I think Turkey has been a uh, staunch uh, supporter of NATO. And it took part in, in many uh, NATO operations and, and missions, which is, by the way, still the case. Throughout these decades, there had been, of course, episodes of divergences and convergences uh, between Turkey and the United States. And this is not specific only to uh, US-Turkey relations. Uh, there had been a, a flurry of problems uh, that were surmounted in the past uh, between the United States and different allies. Uh, I, uh, I'm a living witness. Uh, to, sort, to such uh, divergences uh, in the past. Now, in our case, we have a, a big challenge. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 
the number of challenges uh, is on the rise, which we must all together find, find a solution. Uh, and, and the biggest issue nowadays started with the uh, purchase of Russian-made S-400 uh, Iran uh, defense and missile system. That's S-400. That's right. Uh, and that's not something new, by the way. Uh, it's a, uh, an inheritance uh, from the Obama period when Turkey was uh, seeking to develop a missile, uh, an integrated Iran and missile defense architecture. Uh, the first uh, problem emerged back in 2013 when uh, there was an authorization uh, given by the uh, high-level Turkish leadership uh, to enter into negotiations with the uh, Chinese firm under ban by the United States, by the way. Uh, so there was a kind of challenging period but nothing transpired at the end of it. Uh, the tender was uh, rescinded. Uh, and there was another uh, process initiated by, by Turkey. And in my candid opinion, uh, there was a uh, rather wrong decision on our part. Uh, because what happened in 2014, March of 2014, uh, Russia uh, illegally uh, occupying and annexing Crimea and then starting destabilization of, of the Donbass region. Uh, there was a decision uh, in 2016 at, at the Warsaw Summit, which uh, stated in clear cut terms that NATO members uh, should try to uh, get rid of the uh, Soviet or Russian made uh, military equipment and not to enter into any uh, kind of uh, purchasing deal uh, uh, with Russia. I mean, this was repeated in 2000, May 2017, Brussels 2018 summit. Uh, so there was a kind of politically binding decision uh, taken by the NATO as an institution with the consensus of all uh, allies. So I, I, I say it in very uh, you know, clear terms that uh, it was not uh, it was the worst uh, choice that, that could have been made uh, on our part. And it created a lot of difficulties. Starting in uh, 2016, when uh, Obama was in power in the United States, and then the Trump administration, and now we have the Biden administration. And the problem is still going on. Uh, so this is a very uh, topical issue. Uh, in the framework of bilateral relations between the United States and Turkey, which must be surmounted uh, because that fuels mistrust that has already been building uh, over the last uh, few years uh, between the two countries. Uh, what I would say is that NATO summit could be an opportunity to introduce uh, a solution uh, for the future. Uh, I'm sure that both sides are uh, making the necessary preparations to find a formula uh, satisfactory to both uh, and pursue it uh, in the aftermath of, of, uh, of, of, of the NATO summit scheduled for Monday, uh, the 14th of June. Uh, and of course, there must be a give and take on that. Uh, I mean, application of, of sanctions by the United States to an ally, uh, any, any ally, uh, in, in, in our case, that's Turkey, of course, uh, is not a good step. That is another uh, source of tension uh, between the two countries, that introduction of the Qatsa uh, sanctions. Uh, it, it's not a very uh, ideal way of solving this issue. I'm sure that uh, in the run-up to the summit, uh, both sides are exchanging views on how to find a solution to that uh, big challenge. And there have been two uh, recent visits uh, to Turkey from the United States. 
Ben de Sherman was here, number two at the State Department, and uh, Thomas Greenfield, uh, the US uh, UN uh, permanent representative, she was in Turkey. Uh, and it seems that they uh, exchanged views on how to, uh, to overcome uh, that problem. And of course, uh, this is one divergence, uh, which is rather poisoning the bilateral relations between Turkey and the United States. And, uh, you know, having influence uh, also uh, in NATO, uh, that is certainly the case. But with regard to that uh, YPG uh, PYD issue, uh, that is another big problem. Of course, and that must be addressed uh, by both nations. I mean, every ally uh, has a you know legitimate right to to have its own threat perceptions and take necessary measures uh, when it comes uh, to threats against the territorial against their territorial integrity. Now, it's true, and I, I, mean, I and I said it in in different council meetings when I was at NATO and to colleagues and and everybody it would be rather impossible uh, to convince the Turkish public at large, barring a few marginal groups, that PYD, YPG is not a terrorist organization. I mean, Ashton Carter himself admitted that this is the case, that there is an organic link between PKK uh, and YPG, PYD. as, a, as their to the issue, sir. Yeah. And final, final, my final remarks on that is that course, it would be uh, uh, rather a, a very uh, audacious uh, description if, if we put uh, PYD v, uh, by PG elements uh, or those supporters of PYD uh, by PG with the Kurds living in the region. I mean, there's a misperception, unfortunately, in the West that, you know, uh, that PYD by PG represents the whole uh, Kurdish community uh, living in Syria or in Iraq. Iraq is a different case for the time being. But anyway, I mean, uh, you cannot convince anyone, uh, particularly those involved in uh, security and defense matters, particularly those who eavesdropped the telecommunications between the PKK leadership in uh, Kandil uh, and those people uh, deployed in, in northeastern Syria. I mean, uh, that, that's the evidence, evidence part uh, for those involved. Uh, but the other part is the perception of the Turkish, uh, uh, you know, society at large. So I think this is also something that the United States must think seriously uh, what to do about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your assessment. And uh, let me pose this question to Mr. General, Mr. Kimmet. Uh, Mr. Kimmet, relations between the two countries, USA and Turkey, have been adversely affected due to important problems such as the S-400 air defense system and the YPG, PKK terrorist organization. As Mr. Ambassador mentioned, is it possible to make an assessment in this context, General Kimmet? Uh, an assessment, uh, I, I agree with you, and I think everybody on this panel understands that the relationship between the United States uh, and Turkey has been strained over the past few years, not simply because of S-400, F-35, YPG, PKK, uh, but also the holding of Gulan in Pennsylvania and a number of other issues. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that while this has strained the relationship, it's also important to stand back and realize that countries need to satisfy their own national interests. Uh, certainly we have to acknowledge the interests of our friends and our allies, but at the end of the day, as the old diplomatic saying goes, we don't have friends, we have interests. Now we certainly understand the interests of Turkey in terms of understanding their territorial integrity and uh, wanting to avoid the situation where Syria is a uh, basically a uh, sanctuary and safe haven for YPG terrorists who are now fighting against ISIS and our only partner in that fight against ISIS in northern Syria, but the legitimate security concerns of the 
of the government of Turkey. So I understand there's not only a perception problem, but there is a military security problem with that. Uh, I would also, though, talk about the S-400 system and uh, the reason it remains such a concern of not simply the United States, but all of the NATO partners and all of the countries that are in the mm -hmm. S-35 uh, consortium. So I think that it's important to recognize that S-400 and F-35 is not a U.S.-Turkey problem. Uh, it is a Turkey-NATO problem because, and it's a Turkey-F-35 consortium problem because of yeah. the, the significantly advanced capabilities of the S-400, not only in its multiple range missiles and advanced missiles, its ability to knock down standoff systems that NATO has uh, but also because of the capability of its radar system. Now, nobody is suggesting for a moment that uh, we would anticipate Turkey using those aggressively against either the F-35 consortium or a NATO member, uh, but we also have not been completely persuaded that somehow there is not a Russian backdoor in all of that equipment as well. So I think as we look at the interests of the United States to continue the fight against ISIS uh, versus the interests of Turkey to ensure that the YPG doesn't become a threat uh, to its own national security. But at the same time, look at the F-35 S-400 issue and recognize that there's a significant concern among your allies in NATO uh, and the interests of Turkey as well. So uh, I think that David Satterfield, our ambassador in Turkey uh, I think our uh, representatives up at NATO, all three of us, by the way, were at NATO at the same time, you, Naeem, and the ambassador and I, um, when I was down at SHAPE with Joe Ralston. I think we all recognize mm. that uh, these are a um, hurdle to our relationship, but it should not, it should be something that we intend to try to bring back together and, and work through rather than use it as points of divisiveness and pushing Turkey further away from the relationship with either the United States or with its NATO partners. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Mr. Reynold, leaders from time to time talk about the strategic importance of relations between Turkey and the USA, as you know. Are there, are there any possibilities to solve important problems, especially as mentioned, as 400 air defense system and the YPG, PKK, terrorist organizations? What do you think about this issue, sir? Well, those, uh, those are, uh, uh, it's a good question you ask me. It's a very <laughs> difficult one to answer me. How do you solve the problems of uh, yeah. the S-400 um, and uh, the YPG? Well, let me uh, just step back and um, uh, may first make the comment that I think there, you know, there's uh, both Turkey and the United States have made a number of serious errors with regard to each other in the past several years. Um, and these errors have resulted in worsening relations uh, between the two. But I think we have to stand back and remember what is it that I, I think made it possible for both sides to make uh, those errors. And that is uh, the role of Russia in this. I think when people, particularly in Washington at least, uh, think of Turkey, we have very much a mythological uh, image of Turkey that we created during the Cold War. Um, and that was when we saw Turkey very much as a very close ally, reliable ally against the Soviet Union. Um, and without going into the details, I'll say, you know, for the purpose of our discussion here, that was more or less an accurate uh, picture insofar as both Turkey and the United States understood that in the form of the Soviet Union, they faced a real uh, threat, uh, both to their own national interests and to their own territorial uh, integrity, to their own you know, existence. The Cold War, in many ways, was uh, uh, an existential uh, struggle for both the United States and for Turkey. And uh, it was a real struggle, and it was one where there was an overwhelmingly uh, strong, and I would also say very good and convincing reasons why Turkey and the United States uh, were allied with each other, and they needed to be allies uh, with each other. Today, the fact is that the Russian Federation, 
possesses nothing like either the intentions um, and still less the capabilities of the Soviet Union. And that has perversely allowed both Turkey and the United States, I think, to um, uh, I want was going to say play games with each other, not play games, but rather um, um, downgrade uh, the importance of relations with, the, with each other. And, you know, the clear, uh, one of the clearest examples of that has been American policy in Syria, and particularly with the uh, collaboration uh, with the YPG, uh, which I, I'm absolutely, I have to say this again, as somebody as an American citizen, I'm quite embarrassed by it. And I, it's one of the things, I, most fundamental mistakes, I think that an American, uh, you know, that I can imagine that an American administration could make uh, with regard to relations with Turkey, aside from you know, something short of declaring war on Turkey. Um, that is, we really are, are uh, crossing, a, we have crossed uh, what was very clearly demarcated by Turkey and that anyone who knew anything about Turkey would understand to be an absolute red line. And the only people that we fool in this were ourselves and trying to say, well, the YPG isn't part of the PKK. And the Americans themselves knew this. Um, and we tried to convince ourselves it wasn't the case because it was convenient for us because we had other priorities in Syria. And we decided, OK, well, uh, Turkey's not going to like this, but our priorities are just going to have to uh, take precedence. And uh, Turkey's going to have to live with this. Uh, that was a... Uh, a stupid mistake on the part of the United States for its own, um, uh, I think, best interests. Um, and it was an unbelievably, and I use that word because I'd still, again, find it difficult to believe in the United States. This is unbelievably, um, uh, disrespe and the disrespectful isn't quite the right word. It, it's deeper than that. Um, uh, but I'll say, you know, a disrespectful uh, decision with regard uh, to Turkey. And I'm in some ways amazed, amazed that relations actually aren't worse, given what the United States has done with the, uh, the YPG. Uh, that is something I think, you know, the good news on that issue is I think that's something the United States uh, doesn't need to cooperate with the YPG. And that is, I think, an area where the United States could improve relations with Turkey by uh, cutting all ties with the YPG and assisting Turkey in its uh, struggle with the PKK. Um, you know, that we can, I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about the, the, the whole Kurdish question is immensely complicated, one that most Americans don't understand. And the BKK is only one part of that, an important part of it, but it's just uh, one part of it. And that's another, uh, I think, common mistake among uh, American uh, policymakers. They really have uh, no understanding, really, what is uh, Turkey's uh, Kurdish question, the, the broader regional Kurdish question. And Mark Esper, uh, the former Secretary of Defense, is a good example of that uh, lack of knowledge. Um, so let me, so, and I, as mentioned, I think by uh, General Kimmet, uh, the presence of Fethullah Gulen in, in, the United, in the United States for the past two decades is another enormous um, error on the part of the United uh, States and also uh, quite a provocation uh, towards Turkey. I'd be happy to say more uh, about that. Um, but let me say, uh, just you mentioned the S-400s, uh, so what are some of the mistakes that Turkey has made uh, on its part? But let me mention that the undermining of sanctions towards Iran I think is uh, helping Iran evade uh, financial sanctions. Um, it has definitely been a, an action that has undermined faith in Ankara in Washington has generated a great deal of uh, uh, dissatisfaction uh, towards Turkey. Uh, support on the Palestinian question has been another one. The uh, Erdogan uh, anti-Israel Israel stance has certainly uh, damaged uh, support for Turkey in uh, side of Washington. And then the S-400s, which I have to say, you know, as so someone who studies Turkey and has to explain Turkey to American audiences, I often feel that my obligation is to look at things from the Turkish perspective and explain them to American audiences. But I have to say the S-400, I don't think there's any way you can describe that decision as a colossal mistake an mm -hmm. error on the part of Turkey. It did absolutely nothing uh, for Turkey's national security. They've purchased a weapon system that's quite expensive. It's unclear will Turkey even be able to deploy it. And that has understandably uh, upset not just the United States, but all of Turkey's allies. And further, it has led to Turkey getting kicked out of the F-35 program. And regardless of what one thinks of the F-35, uh, you know, is it as good a weapon system as some people claim? I think, uh, again, I'm not an expert in this. I think there's, there, you know, Turkey has suffered uh, and will suffer from having been kicked out of that program because that was something that would have been uh, very useful to the Turkish uh, defense industry uh, in further expanding its capacities in uh, both production and in uh, technology of, uh, of weapons. 
Um, I should probably have gone on more than five minutes. So let me uh, just stop there and you can ask me for any follow-ups. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for your assessment. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Mankoff, uh, if you want to comment on the previous speakers, welcome. And we will continue with as from the 400 air defense system, the Russian made as 400 air defense system an important obstacle in Turkey and the USA relations. May I, may I ask your assessment on this issue again, sir? Sure. Um, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Babarolu, um, in Istanbul Aydin University and, and my fellow panelists. Um, let me start by saying that um, my comments uh, reflect my personal views and not those of my employer, National Defense University, the Defense Department, or the US government. Um, I won't comment on what the previous speakers have said. I think they um, can speak for themselves. Um, on the question of the S-400, I think you have to look at um, these questions that we've been discussing so far today, Syria, the PKK, YPG issue, and the S-400 in an integrated way. Because I think the Turkish decision to pursue the purchase of the S-400 came in a particular context that was connected to the breakdown of relations with the United States over uh, US support for the YPG in Syria. Um, I think there was a uh, calculation in uh, the wake of that crisis in bilateral relations and in the wake of Russia's own intervention in the Syrian conflict in 2015, um, that um, working more closely with Russia would help advance what Turkey saw as being its own interests in Syria um, in a more effective way and would give it more leverage in terms of dealing with the United States with which it was in the midst of this political and, and security crisis. And so the decision to, to purchase the S-400 system, I think was in a way a response to these concerns. There were other um, concerns having to do with um, the inability to negotiate a contract for the, the purchase of US built Patriot uh, air defense systems um, as well. But I think this broader uh, geopolitical context, including um, developments in Syria, it was part and parcel of this decision. And I think I agree with some of the previous speakers who said that I think in terms of Turkey's long-term strategic interests, it was ultimately a mistake, um, not only because it um, further deepened the rupture with Turkey's traditional NATO allies and ended up with its expulsion from the F-35 program, but it also locked it into this expensive uh, arms deal with Russia for a system that ultimately it may not be able to use. Um, I don't know what the ultimate resolution of this uh, problem is going to be, but I know that the United States and Turkey's other NATO allies are pushing for some kind of resolution that would see um, the system in some way left inoperable, perhaps something similar to what um, ended up happening with the S-300 system that um, uh, was transferred from Cyprus to Greece. Um, and so at the end of the day, I don't know that Turkey is going to get the benefit of having the S-400 system. And it has also uh, had to deal with this now several year long uh, crisis that was touched off uh, in its relationship with the United States. One aspect of that crisis that hasn't been raised yet and that I think it's important to, to mention is uh, the role of the CATSA sanctions, because I think it's important for the audience to understand this. Those were passed into law by Congress. Um, and that means that the U.S. administration, whether it's President Trump, President Biden, some prospective successor, has very limited flexibility in waiving the applicability of those sanctions to any country or entity uh, that purchases uh, weapon systems produced by the Russian defense industry. Um, and there is substantial domestic pressure in the United States right now over this issue. Um, and I think that President Biden is going to um, be having frank conversations with President Erdogan over this issue uh, during their meeting. Uh, but I think the fact of the matter remains that the United States and the Biden administration has limited flexibility in terms of what it can and can't do under the terms of the, the CATSA provisions that were uh, passed by Congress. And so as long as 
this S-400 issue remains on the table, I think those sanctions are going to be hard to completely evade. Um, in terms of the S-400 and Turkey's relationship with Russia, I think that um, we have come to a point where um, there's an interest in both the United States and in Turkey in overcoming some of the uh, crises and the, and the, the divisions uh, that have rolled that relationship over the last several years. Um, but that means now that Turkey has to figure out how to um, maneuver around this issue in its relationship with Russia because the contract has been signed. Um, we don't, of course, know specifically what the terms are, but presumably uh, Russia has some say in terms of uh, what kind of information about the system can be turned over uh, to NATO partners, uh, what kind of access they can give, what ultimately is going to happen to that system if it ends up not being used. Um, and so I think there's a very complicated set of issues here that need to be worked out both on the Russia NATO, or I'm sorry, on the Turkey NATO front and on the, the Turkey Russia front. Um, so let me stop there because I know we're, we're pressed for time. Okay. Appreciate, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fariz Ismailzade, the USA Syria policy, especially its support for the YPG, PKK terrorist organization, as you know, is inconsistent with Turkey's national security. In this context, how can there be a solution to this problem? May I ask your assessment, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be on this panel with- You're welcome, sir. Some of my friends uh, whom I have met before and also some of the new colleagues. Um, well, I, as you know, I live in Azerbaijan. I work for AD University in Azerbaijan. And I would like to uh, just briefly describe the perspective that we see from Azerbaijan, from South Caucasus to this issue. Uh, for us, in 1990s, when Azerbaijan became independent, Turkey was really a symbol of the West because of its partnership with NATO, membership in NATO, because of its uh, aspirations to become member of EU. For us, uh, really, for the newly independent states, um, aligning with Turkey was really meant to be aligning with the West. And uh, for, at that time, I remember we didn't make really big difference between US policy in the Caucasus and Turkish policy. For us, it was the same. Uh, therefore, such strategic projects like regional energy pipelines, gas pipelines, oil pipelines that we built from Azerbaijan to Turkey, uh, really that happened with the support of US. US policy in the Caucasus uh, coincided with the Turkish policy. But uh, somewhere uh, starting uh, from 2000s, uh, we started noticing some differences between US and Turkish policies in the, in the region. Um, we saw some uh, beginning collaboration between Russia and Turkey in energy field. Uh, there was Blue Stream pipeline built. There was a rising trade between the two countries. Uh, there was rising level of tourism from Russia to Turkey and many Turkish companies now participating in uh, construction projects and uh, other projects in, in, Ru in Russia. So the growing relationships uh, between Russia and Turkey has changed the nature of regional politics. And we see gradually that Turkey is not necessarily pursuing the uh, American or NATO or Western policies in the region, but rather pursuing its own na national interests. The interests that fit uh, Turkish national, the policies that fit Turkish national interests. Um, this is especially evident uh, when it comes to relationship with Russia, for example, the South Caucasus, and also gradually we saw that happening in places like Syria. Um, what, what, what can we say about the future of, of these relationships, right? I think that uh, Turkey is too big to be ignored and Turkey is too important in terms of in such issues like migration, uh, security, uh, fight against terrorism, fight against international terrorism. So uh, I think that eventually uh, both European Union, NATO allies, they, they understand that uh, Turkey cannot be ignored and Turkey must be uh, consulted, must be cooperated with. And uh, the recent events in South Caucasus really showed that the only power from the Western Alliance that was able to withstand uh, towards Russia and to um, you know, ensure the 
uh, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, give support to Azerbaijan was Turkey. Turkey now became very active player in South Caucasus. Turkey has become a security guarantor in the South Caucasus. So in that regard, I think places like South Caucasus, places like uh, Syria, uh, and also some other transnational issues like migration, uh, Europe and US need Turkey very much. And I think that this relationship will get towards improvement in my opinion. I'll stop here for uh, further questions and remarks. Thank you. Appreciate, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, now concerning leader summit, I pose this question to all of you, of course. And Mr. Jaylan, Mr. Ambassador, do you say President Biden and Turkish President Erdogan will meet in Brussels on June 14, as you know. Biden and Erdogan can end the Turkish-American standoff. Matters of dispute, of course. What could we expect from this meeting? What is your expectation from this meeting, sir? Thank you. Thank you again for, for this question. Uh, well, I... I'm a diplomat, so I have to be hopeful, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, we, we did not uh, carry out our diplomatic uh, duties uh, as uh, desperados, but uh, trying to find solutions to issues through diplomatic channels. I think that's important. And uh, bringing together the commonalities rather than differences uh, is an important tool uh, that diplomats use. So I imagine, uh, first and foremost, let me tell you something. The, uh, the rumor is that, but that's a rumor, uh, that this uh, bilateral contact will last about an hour or so. Uh, so if you include the, uh, uh, the translation part of it, the interpretation transport, uh, translation, maximum 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, so you cannot expect uh, this meeting uh, to to be a miracle uh, in solving these challenges uh, in bilateral ties between the United States and Turkey. So I think the grounds must be prepared before the meeting. And I, and I believe that this is exactly uh, what's happening. Uh, when we look at the uh, uh, you know, telephone traffic uh, and the increasing number of uh, contacts, uh, either uh, in front of the scene or behind the scene, I'm sure that the grounds are being prepared uh, both in, in, in a bilateral context and also via using NATO channels. Uh, but I, will, I, I don't think that it will be a magic wand uh, that, that would solve all the problems being faced by Turkey and the United States, but it could be a boost. Uh, now, I'm sure that uh, both uh, uh, presidents will talk about the S-400 issue, which I think there should be a, a, a solution, the sooner the better, for many reasons, uh, both for our own interests and also for the interests of, of, of our allies and also for NATO, because there's a NATO, clear NATO decision uh, on it that we have to have interoperable systems that would work with, uh, with the NATO systems. Now, I mean, our, our air and missile defense uh, systems are integrated to Rammstein, uh, that's the uh, NATO the Allied uh, Air Command, and also to Torreon in Spain, uh, that's the, the master radar, uh, which collects all data uh, coming from different Allied countries. So, so S-400 cannot, uh, cannot uh, operate with these systems, that's clear. Uh, what we need is, and we have emphasized this since 2000. 12 from the Chicago summit onwards, that uh, we need uh, full protection and coverage uh, of the Turkish soil uh, against all sorts of missile attacks. So for this, you need an integrated system. Uh, local protection or protection of a limited area uh, is an unstarter as far as the integrated air and missile defense system is concerned. So that will certainly be the key issue uh, in the bilateral uh, contact between uh, the presidents uh, in Brussels. Uh, and of course, Turkey will talk about, I'm sure, about Syria, about Libya. 
Afghanistan and, and Ukraine. Uh, and these will be the issues. And there are potential areas of uh, cooperation, uh, real cooperation uh, between the United States and Turkey when it, for, when it comes, for instance, to Afghanistan. Now, one of the decisions taken will be to, uh, to have the uh, operation and maintenance of the Kabul International Airport uh, shouldered by Turkey for many years. Of course, we will, uh, as in the past, we will need logistic support and some financial support from NATO channels. That is certainly the case. I mean, we cannot uh, finance it all through, all through our own means only. So we need uh, uh, additional or rather contributions, financial contributions to continue with that operation and maintenance of Kabul International Airport. And that's a, that's a good area where Turkey and, and the United States uh, can cooperate. And we will host uh, a, you know, the peace conference between the Afghan government and Taliban, uh, which was scheduled for the 24th of April, but that was postponed uh, because of, I think, uh, some hurdles uh, created by the Taliban. Uh, they were rather reluctant uh, to come to Turkey uh, because they were expecting the withdrawal of all NATO forces uh, from Afghanistan on the 1st of May which will not happen. Uh, it will continue up until 11th of September this year. Uh, Ukraine is another interesting topic maybe uh, that could be addressed. Uh, we are the only country <laughs> uh, as, a, as a neighbor, as a strategic partner, uh, supporting uh, Ukraine right from the very beginning. And also in NATO fora, um, in, in vocal terms that sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine is a must for us. We will not accept uh, the illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea by Russia. And we are against uh, what separatists, separatists supported by Russia are doing in, in the Donbas region of Ukraine. I mean, there is a divergence uh, between Turkey and Russia in, on that matter. And that will not change, by the way. And, we, and Turkey was bold enough to sell uh, uh, UAVs to Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky was in Turkey in April, uh, and we are supporting their naval capacity and capabilities and cooperating on it. Uh, so it's, it's a very uh, solid uh, form of support as far as Turkey is concerned, and that should be appreciated. But we are doing it for our own interests, of course. Uh, I mean, Ukraine has become the victim uh, of aggression, uh, so that must be resisted by all allies. That's a clear-cut opinion in my mind. Uh, Syria, Syria is a, is a rather challenging ground for everybody. Uh, but as far as Idlib is, is concerned, for instance, uh, there is a challenge between uh, Turkey and Russia. We know what happened in Idlib, Idlib uh, starting in January 2020. Uh, and I, I follow the events very closely. Um, in a broader context, let, let me put it that way. I mean, when we see the, the belt around Turkey, uh, starting from Transnistria, and then you have uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Crimea, and thanks God the Nagorno-Karabakh issue has, has reached a new dimension, uh, nevertheless, uh, there are still some seeds of potential conflict over there. Uh, and the Russians, there is a Russian presence still in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which is not uh, a, an extremely happy uh, uh, event for Turkey. But anyway, and then in Syria, uh, we had problems with Russia. Uh, so I, the, the perception is that Turkey is developing a tie of strategic uh, uh, links with Russia uh, on all these issues, which is not the case. I mean, nobody can convince Turkey uh, to accept Russian presence in, in Transnistria uh, in contravention of, of its uh, commitments. Nobody would uh, uh, persuade Turkey in accepting the uh, Abkhazian and South Ossetian uh, case breakaway uh, republics, quote-unquote, in Georgia. Again, another territorial uh, integrity violation. 
And I mean, as an ordinary uh, Turkish citizen, as a Turk, as, as a pre, you know, former uh, Turkish diplomat, I'm not very happy with the Russian presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. I, I have to be very uh, frank on that. And of course, we don't see eye to eye uh, on, on the future of Syria uh, with Russia. And we are in different camps in, uh, in Libya, you know that. Uh, and I think Turkish presence in Libya should have been wel welcomed by our allies, but that didn't turn out to be the case. Anyway, it's our res responsibility, uh, primary responsibility to normalize our relations in the region. There is no doubt about it. And uh, Turkey has committed certain mistakes in antagonizing uh, relations uh, in, in her neighborhood, immediate neighborhood, uh, which should be uh, redressed. And the sooner the better, uh, both for Turkey itself and, and for the alliance, uh, by the way. Uh, so that's the case. So what, what I can say is that, I mean, if you start like uh, balancing acts and do it on a transactional basis, uh, then you run the risk of uh, having a stalemate. With Russia, you can have a transactional relationship, economic, commercial, tourism, and, and what have you. But if you give the perception that this is at a strategic level, uh, that would be a, a uh, rather misperceived by, by many, uh, both in the region and beyond the region. So you cannot jockey... Uh, your diplomatic relations from your historical background uh, at the same level. I mean, you have to have a strategic anchor and you have to enrich that anchor with such kinds of, you know, different layers of, of relationships, including Russia. And that's not against uh, what NATO decided uh, in 2016 at Warsaw, uh, the dual track approach. The collective defense, collective deter deterrence and defense on the one hand, and dialogue on the other hand. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of the approach adopted by, by the Alliance. And I think it's the right one. It's, it's the right direction. Uh, but the point is, I mean, if, if your historical neighbors, allies and partners start to perceive you as uh, running two different tracks trying to kind of play off between these two tracks, then that would create problems. And that's what we have faced, uh, both in the region uh, and beyond. And I hope that, uh, that these issues will also be addressed by both leaders. And one thing is sure, I mean, uh, looking at the uh, plethora of statements given by uh, uh, uh, the president of the United States, he will definitely raise uh, the backsliding in the democratic traditions in Turkey and, you know, uh, fundamental uh, uh, liberties, human rights and, and what have you. He will raise it. I mean, that, that is the case and, and you cannot hide it. Uh, and that is one of the issues uh, that will be raised by the U.S. side. And I'm sure about it. But my comfort is that, I mean, over the last uh, few uh, months, starting with uh, the new year, 2021, Turkey finally uh, realized that uh, it's in her benefit uh, to maintain and uphold uh, her relations uh, with its Western uh, allies and partners. It started to, you know, to have some yeah. openings, including the United States, including Western European uh, uh, countries, and also in her region. And I think that's the right uh, way to proceed. Thank you. Let me stop here. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate, sir. Thank you. And Mr. General, the same question to you. Do you say President Biden and Turkish President Erdogan, as you know, will meet in Brussels on 14th of July, June? Biden and Erdogan can end the Turkish American standoff, matter of dispute in this meeting. What is your expectation, sir? Well, I've got some fairly low expectations, quite honestly. Uh, by the way, one of the issues that we haven't brought up uh, is the Armenian Genocide Declaration uh, here in the United States, which is only going to, which is yet another nail in the in the 
coffin of the relationship between our two countries. Uh, given the portfolio of issues that uh, President Biden has to address, uh, I think that there, this would be, if we could have more than just simply some pronouncements of uh, willingness to demonstrate goodwill between our countries, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here and very little of it will be solved with the bilats. Part of that is because, uh, you know, policy is people and people make policy. And as I take a look at the groups that will probably have a lot of influence on preparing the uh, preparatory documents for the president, the, the so-called deliverables and the expectations. You take a look over at DOD, you've got Colin Call as the undersecretary for policy who was part of the Obama administration. Um, he came in, uh, who was part of the Obama administration, who came in dead set about pulling out of Iraq and then was chastened in 2014 when he had to send, had to participate in sending Americans back in. So I think he has a significant uh, anti-ISIS bent to him and on this balance between YPG, P, uh, uh, PKK and Syria, I think that his political viewpoints, his policy viewpoints would be do more of what's being done now. Uh, especially as it was President Trump in the former administration that was pulling people out. You take a look at Toria Newland, who is the assistant, who is now the undersecretary for policy at the State Department, a noted anti-Russian um, advocate. She too was the ambassador at NATO. She was the DCM at NATO during some of the toughest period in the last 20 years on the issues of Russia. So I don't think she is going to be uh, seeking a lot of significant rapprochement with Turkey because of this flirtation with Russia that is perceived. And of course, you got Brett McGurk back at the National Security Council, you know, basically one of the architects of the Syria policy under President Obama, and to some extent under President Trump, and, and uh, quit the administration as the special envoy when President Trump decided to pull people out of Syria. So on that specific issue, which is one of the most um, nettlesome between our two countries, uh, I think the personalities involved in preparing the, the work for the president in terms of what he can achieve uh, and seeks to achieve with President Erdogan at that bilat, I would be very surprised to see any kind of um, changes, significant changes to the Syria policy. Uh, Gulan, same thing, he will say, as the past presidents have said, this is a matter for our judicial branch and I can't interfere. Katza, he will say, legislative branch, I can't interfere. Um, so uh, I don't see the uh, areas for significant breakthroughs in the bilats particularly with everything else that the president is trying to achieve with NATO, uh, with Putin, with Boris Johnson. So I would keep my expectations low. Okay, sir, appreciate, thank you. And the same question to Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds, the same question sure. for Leader Summit in Brussels on 14 June, your expectation? Let me start with what I think is the good news. Um, and that is, I think in both, uh, both Ankara and Washington have finally begun to emerge out of the uh, overly emotional uh, and, uh, sense of frustration uh, that has governed uh, policymaking uh, and bilateral relations in both uh, in both Ankara and in Washington, and that frustration and anger uh, I think stems out of you know a number of the things that we've talked about uh, uh, actions taken by both the United States and Turkey, such as support for the YPG, purchase of S four hundreds, etc. Those things that we've discussed today, but I also think feeding into that frustration and emotion has been a broader frustration in both countries with their failed Middle Eastern policies. Uh, here we are in 2021, and I think if you were to go back 20 years ago and tell people 
that in another two decades, the United States will be effectively handing over Afghanistan to the Taliban. It will be concerned with a group called the Islamic State, which is more virulent uh, than Al Qaeda. And we would be having a panel right, right now asking the question, can Turkey and the United States rebuild the relations? Heads would have spun. Uh, this was absolutely un, un, unimaginable back in 2001 that we'd be where we are today. And when you think of the amount of resources and effort that the United States has poured into its Middle Eastern policy over those two decades, it's a stunning, uh, grandiose uh, fiasco and failure. Likewise, I think one can point to Turkey's uh, foreign policy there too and, and just see a litany of failure over the past several years. Uh, Turkey is now feuding um, with all of its neighbors. And so, you know, the good news is that both Washington and Ankara have realized we should patch things up, that there are good reasons why uh, Turkey and the United States need to get along uh, better. Um, I think, though, now to come to the bad news, I think uh, on uh, the part of Ankara, uh, is, uh, Erdogan has really put Turkey between a rock and a hard place. That is, Turkey, Erdogan took a very bold and risky move by starting to, uh, I don't want to use the word align more, but collaborate, cooperate more with Russia. And again, I've written on this and I understand the reasons why he did that. Uh, but Russia, Putin has clearly has been sending the signals that now that Erdogan is sending signals to Washington, look, I want to get along with you again. I'm willing to stand alongside you, perhaps uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, and in other areas. Uh, Putin's watching that and he's sending signals. It's not going to be so easy. You're going to pay a price for that. You know, one of the uh, more obvious ones is holding up the Russian tourists who are not able to come in to, to Turkey this summer, allegedly, uh, for COVID. And we shouldn't forget that when Turkey did shoot down the Russian jet, I think it was back in it was 2015, uh, Putin rather uh, impressively was able to bend Erdogan, uh, uh, I don't want to say to his knee, but was able to get Erdogan to turn around. Uh, so clearly, Russia, I think, can put a lot of uh, pressure on Erdogan. You know, we could, again, the, the Turkish economy is not in that good a shape. Uh, and Erdogan really now has, he's burned so many bridges, both inside this country and outside, that it's going to be difficult, I think, in some ways for him to deliver to the United States um, uh, what he would like to without paying a price elsewhere. And so that's going to be, uh, it's going to be a time for some very difficult decisions um, in Ankara. On the American side, I think the problem there is that the bad news there is that although America realizes, yes, Turkey actually is quite important to the United States for a whole slew of reasons, uh, and I won't waste time in enumerating them, but actually you can just go around the map on Turkey and you can find an area where Turkey is quite important to U.S. policy, and then areas even beyond uh, Turkey's immediate neighborhood, uh, one could add to that. So Turkey is quite important to the United States. The United States is realizing that we can't just write the country off. On the other hand, there's this, I think, still a reigning mythology in Washington, and I would say with the in the Biden administration as well, that you know the fundamental problem that America has with Turkey is Erdogan. And once Erdogan goes, things are again a lot easier. And I would flip that on its head, and I would tell Americans is that your problems with Turkey are a lot bigger than Erdogan. In fact, I would suggest that some of the one of the biggest contributors to Erdogan's popularity has been his ability to play a, a Turkish uh, anti-American sentiment uh, in his favor. And that sentiment is not simply whipped up by Erdogan, but it's generated by American concrete policies. Um, and again, you know, that goes back to support for the YPG, uh, you know, collaboration with the Fethullah Gulen, uh, et cetera. And Erdogan has been able to turn that uh, to his benefit. And the idea that, okay, Erdogan goes, everything becomes much easier for the United States, I think is a big mistake. Uh, now it's possible, again, I, I, that uh, a future leader of Turkey might say, okay, the United States is that important to, United, to Turkey, and I'm going to craft my policies to get along, but I would not count on that from the American perspective. We have done significant damage to the relations with Turkey that will, you know, will not be forgotten inside of Turkey. And if we're going to expect more from Turkey, we're also going to have to give Turkey uh, a lot more. Uh, and I don't think that Washington is yet at that point of recognizing um, exactly how badly it's run both its relations with Turkey, but also more generally in the Middle East. And there is going to be a reckoning, I think, in American foreign policy, uh, both relations with Turkey, but more broadly, is still ahead of us. Thank you, sir. Appreciate. Thanks. Mr. Mankov. Uh, concerning Leader Summit. Mm -hmm. 14th of June in Brussels. May I ask your expectation? Mm -hmm. Sure. 
I would also temper expectations of any breakthroughs at the mm -hmm. summit. Um, I do think there is a recognition on both sides that there are a number of interests or there are a number of areas where there needs to be better U.S.-Turkish communication, if not active cooperation. And even on some of the issues that we've talked about as being major sources of disagreement between the two, there is some opportunity for progress. That said, I think the broader context makes the kind of resetting of the relationship that maybe some uh, people in the media or who are outside looking at this are hoping for unlikely. So what I would characterize as the good news is one, the recognition on both sides that um, allowing the relationship to go off the rails as much as it has over the last five or six years is not really in either country's interest. And that from a political standpoint, it's better to try and figure out if there are areas uh, where some of that damage can be repaired. That's moreover on the two big issues that we've been talking about, that is the S-400 and uh, the YPG in Syria, I actually think in some ways we're in a slightly better place today than we were a couple of years ago. Um, I think the recognition in Turkey about the costs of being locked into the S-400 arrangement have become clearer, and there seems to be a greater recognition on the part of the Turkish political leadership that um, the costs of, of signing this deal have been too high and that it would be better for Turkey's own security and Turkey's own interests to um, find a way of coming back into the fold with its NATO allies by addressing some of their concerns about the intelligence gathering um, and security vulnerabilities that possession of the, of the S-400 could pose. On Syria and the YPG, I think that there's still a fundamental divide between the way that Turkey and the United States perceive the YPG. And if you look at Biden administration's requests for funding, um, some of, of what they're asking Congress to provide uh, for vetted um, groups in Syria probably is going to go towards the Syrian Democratic Forces, which includes the YPG. So it looks like you know the Biden administration is not going to back away from um, the support for uh, the YPG that its predecessors have shown. Um, there's a continued uh, belief that they are the most effective fighting force on the ground against the potential for a resurgence of ISIS. Um, which is the U.S. Um, pulls out of Syria um, is, I think, still the number one security concern uh, here in Washington. That said, I think because of Turkey's own military operations on the ground uh, in northern Syria over the last couple of years, um, Turkey has done a, a significant uh, amount in order to contain the danger that the YPG poses to its own interests. Um, and so I think in some ways there is, th this issue is still politically very sensitive, but I think the actual security implications are less pronounced today than they would have been three, four or five years ago. And that that uh, changed reality on the ground, Turkey's success in pushing the YPG back from the border areas and consolidating its control over some of those regions has lessened the security challenges that the YPG and US support for it um, poses to Turkey's interests. So I don't think that this summit is necessarily going to resolve this problem, but I do think that there's some space for having conversations on this issue in a way that um, maybe there wasn't before. Now, if that is all well and good. The problem, I think, is that at least here in Washington, the expectations for the U.S.-Turkey relationship are very, very low. Um, I think the amount of mistrust that's built up over the last several years is uh, enormous. Some of that has to do with developments domestically within Turkey. Um, I think it's notable that the Biden administration has made a um, commitment to democratic restoration, uh, proving the viability of liberal democracy in what it sees as a, an almost ideolo ideological contest with Russia and China as the centerpiece of its foreign policy vision. And in that context, I think uh, concerns about democratic backsliding, the um, growing authoritarianism within Turkish domestic politics is becoming more of a problem uh, for bilateral U.S.-Turkish relations. Um, I think, too, uh, the Biden administration during, uh, during President Biden's um, upcoming travels, he's meeting with the G7, uh, he's meeting with uh, European allies, and he's going to be reinforcing uh, this commitment to strengthening democracy and strengthening democratic solidarity, uh, both within the transatlantic space and globally. And I think if you look at the views of Turkey in uh, France, uh, in Germany, 
um, and a lot of uh, important U.S. allies in Europe, they're also pretty bad right now. And I think to the extent that this administration is going to be prioritizing rebuilding transatlantic solidarity on the basis of shared democratic values, that is going to further complicate the prospects for any short-term improvement in, in U.S.-Turkish relations. Thank you, sir. Appreciate. Thank you. Mr. Faris, may I ask the same question? What is your evaluation for Leader Summit on, in Brussels on 14 of June? Yes, thank you very much. I am uh, somewhat optimistic about this meeting because I think both United States and Turkey have uh, understood that uh, this kind of uh, problematic relationship is not serving uh, any good to both sides. So I think there will, there, they will try, the leaders will try to find common grounds for cooperation. Uh, US has been absent from uh, the region of South Caucasus, from post-Soviet space. Uh, and uh, we have a feeling that US is trying to come back somewhat with the help of active diplomacy. Um, Turkey could be an ally in that regard. Turkey is already very active in the region. Central Asia, Afghanistan, South Caucasus, Middle East, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Turkish businesses are even more active uh, in Africa than many um, businesses of European countries. So Turkey is pursuing very uh, active policy, both in political and business fields, trade fields. Uh, Turkey is uh, also very assertive when it comes to some national interest issues and uh, energy issues. Um, Turkey has really become a regional power, dominant power. And uh, US, if US wants to be active in the region, if US wants to have a presence in the re region, uh, cooperation with Turkey is a must. It's very important. Without Turkey, uh, some of the regional problems such as migration, energy, transport corridors cannot be resolved. Um, the problem is that I think Turkey is still regarded by many Western powers as a small appendix to NATO or small appendix to European Union something that was really left over from 1980s. But Turkey is not the same Turkey that was in 1980s. Turkey is much bigger in terms of economy, much bigger in terms of size, population, outreach, uh, expansion uh, of trade links, uh, participation in regional politics. So uh, these must be acknowledged at Washington. And if Washington wants to have a role in this region, uh, going with Turkey, going together with Turkey is very important and is a must. Uh, we have seen the uh, you know, decreasing role of US in some parts of the Eurasia. And uh, this is partly because of the uh, domestic problems in US and the views towards the world economy and world politics. But also it's the way the world politics are changing. The world politics are becoming more based on regional powers, regionalism. And in that context, Turkey is a very important player in the region, and it's becoming a dominant uh, hub uh, for greater Eurasia. So I will, I, will, I will think that the two leaders will try to find common ground and at least to try to cooperate on non-sensitive issues, such as uh, fight against international uh, terrorism, um, migration, foreign investments, uh, security, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate. Thank you. And Mr. Ambassador, we have another issue. Let's say I'm going to pose this question to all of you. In particular, sir, three crises that have tested the USA and Turkey relations. The first one is S-400 air defense system. The second, YPG, PKK terrorist organization. And the third is Eastern Mediterranean. When we consider these significant issues, is 2021, this year, going to be a hard year for the USA and Turkey? What is your evaluation, sir? Thank you. Uh, it will be a hard year for all uh, because <laughs> strategic rivalry is on the rise. Uh, I've been following the U.S. national security military strategy uh, for many years, uh, coming from a NATO background, who is a person uh, 
who was reared in, in NATO for over like uh, 20 years or so, uh, starting with the Cold War and post-Cold War and Afghanistan, 9-11 and, and, and what have you, uh, Ukraine, 2014. So it will be hard here uh, because it's, it's, it's now become evident uh, that the United States uh, in its threat assessment, including the recent March 2021 uh, interim uh, national security strategy, which I read very carefully, I mean, there are primarily two uh, challenges uh, the United States will have to take into consideration. That's Russia and China. And that will have ramifications uh, uh, for NATO. Uh, that will have also implications uh, for uh, partners uh, in the Far East, like Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Japan. That is certainly the case. And for this reason, uh, the United States needs uh, the cooperation uh, of its allies in Europe more than ever. That's the case. So the, we are, I mean, only talking about uh, the uh, the hard part of of, of the 2020 fund up until the end. You know, it it it would be rather insufficient, uh, in my in my opinion. We have entered a a very difficult uh, era, uh, which will keep many uh, countries, including the United States, busy. Uh, because of these shifting uh, powers of center. Uh, so, under such circumstances, I wonder whether there is any white space for maneuver uh, uh, for allies, including Turkey and the United States. Because this summit, I'm sure that uh, the, prim the primary message that the United States president will uh, give uh, is that he intends to, to reinforce the transatlantic link. He will talk about it, I'm sure about, sure about that. And that will certainly have a prominent place in the communique, which will be issued at the end of the summit. That he said it twice, America is back. He said it when he took office, and he said it very recently uh, in the United Kingdom. So let's see how America is back, how this will translate in the transatlantic framework. Many of us are hopeful. I, I think the United States uh, have finally realized that it's also in its interest to keep the transatlantic bond uh, strong, to keep the alliance militarily stronger and also politically strong because let's, let's not forget, I think this is rather uh, put at the back burner on many occasions because it's taken for granted uh, that NATO is not solely a military alliance. It is a political military alliance. The political part of it was rather uh, uh, put behind the scenes. Now it's coming up. When you read the NATO 2030 uh, uh, United for a New Era report, you will see that there are many proposals towards strengthening the political role of NATO, which is important, which means that there will be a renewed emphasis on the resilience of allies and the readiness of forces under a different and entirely different security landscape, which will be dominated by strategic competition between, among the United States, Russia, and China. So this is what we will witness uh, throughout the remainder of the year and in the coming years. Let's not forget that the Alliance will uh, start preparing a, an updated new strategic concept which is expected to be adopted in 2022. Uh, and let's see, that, that could have a kind of galvanizing role 
uh, in terms of the alliance. Uh, that I, I remember the previous occasions when the alliance uh, started such preparations, there will certainly be uh, divergences and painstaking negotiations over it. But in 2022, we will have a new uh, NATO strategic concept uh, for the next decade uh, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, so it will be a, it will be a, a, a you know a hard process uh, for Turkey, for the United States, and for the rest of the allies. Uh, my my hope is that uh, this bilateral uh, beating between uh, the U.S. president and uh, uh, President Erdogan kickstarts a process whereby both countries demonstrate their willingness on a mutual basis to find a solution to the challenges they have. Maybe by not putting all the, all the things in the same basket, but by separating issues, by compartmentalizing issues and trying to, to, you know, to settle them uh, on their own merits. Because if you put too many issues in the same basket, that would backfire, uh, which should not be the desired result. So to your question, yes, it will be a difficult period, uh, during the remainder of the year, following the summit, uh, but it's, it will not be uh, difficult solely for Turkey and or the United States, but for the alliance as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate. Thank you. Mr. General? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's somewhat my role to continue to be the pessimist and sort of be the most pessimistic <laughs> Um, I actually think 2021 will be the year that we put the shovel down as this hole has been dug between the two countries. Uh, unlike Hillary Clinton, I don't think there will be a reset button to handle, but I think there will be some goodwill on the part of both countries in 2021 to uh, improve the bilateral relations. I'm just afraid that 2022 and beyond uh, those significant problems, few of them will have been solved. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, when President Biden talks about the transatlantic relationship, uh, is, does he consider Turkey to be part of the transatlantic relationship? Or is it much like the EU that considers themselves Europe without Turkey? Uh, three, will the military side... Um, look at my friends in Turkey and say, well, this is kind of like 1966 when France pulled out of the NATO command structure. Uh, we did have a NATO, but NATO was, but there was always this NATO with this asterisk called France. And until they came back into the NATO command structure, there really was, um, as, as the ambassador and the general will remember, there was always this question about whether you could count on France to be part of NATO. And I'm wondering if that same attitude is now starting to pervade uh, NATO that you, know, you now need to put, take that asterisk off France and put that asterisk on Turkey. So we'll see. I, I think that we can all hope that things will get better. I think what will come out of the NATO discussions and the NATO communique is a, is a America's back view and a cohesive, message coming out of NATO. Uh, but I think at this point, we've got to see Turkey as a, an exceptional case to that relationship between President Biden and NATO. I think there will be, in many minds, there's a relationship with NATO and there's a relationship with Turkey, and those two don't necessarily overlap. Uh, and I am a concern that uh, many of Turkey's former friends in NATO, as was mentioned earlier, um, are, are, are perhaps unwilling to come to, to Turkey's defense if the relationships get any worse within NATO and within the United States. But again, I'm a friend of Turkey, and because of that, I'm a pessimist at U.S. policy towards Turkey because, as mentioned by Jeff Mankoff, I don't think the, uh, it is truly appreciated, perhaps in this forum, and certainly not between our uh, the think tanks that we have inside this country, how damaged the relationship is perceptually between the two countries. And that's on both sides 
of that relationship. But let's hope for better times. Thank you, sir. Appreciate for your pessimistic <laughs> assessment. Sir. It balances out the discussion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, yes, uh, I, um, I, I, I, I, sorry, just a second. Uh, if you want to comment on the uh, previous assessment, welcome. But I have different question. Okay. Let me pose this question, sir. When we come to Turkey-Russian relations, uh, because time goes fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we come to Turkey-Russian relations, there is a positive cooperation between Turkey and Ukraine, as we know. What will be the impact of this cooperation on Turkey-Russia relations? Oh, that's a, that's a very big question, a very yeah. uh, good one. But, but um, let, let me just let, if you want to comment on the previous uh, issue, please, welcome. Sure, I'll, I'll yeah. try, I'll take a stab okay. first at answering the question you asked about the importance of Turkish-Ukrainian relations vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, so one of the areas where I see people who are pushing for um, a revival improvement in Turkish-American relations um, are pointing out the importance of Turkey for containing Russia. And that's absolutely true. Um, however, I just want to say on that, and this is something that you know, this isn't the forum to go into it. I also happen to think not only is American policy towards Turkey have been quite flawed, but I think probably American policy towards Russia since the end of the Cold War is probably America's biggest uh, strategic mistake. And some people are slowly kind of coming around to that uh, understanding uh, with the rise of China. Uh, but I think that's uh, probably we're, we're it's too little uh, too late. And uh, I think this is probably it potentially has been really a colossal mistake. Um, uh, American policy towards Russia. Therefore, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a great advocate of the idea that the way to improve uh, Turkish-American relations is essentially to bait the Russian bear. Um, that uh, we working side by side uh, with Turkey, playing up the issue of Crimea in particular, which has a limited amount of, of emotional resonance uh, among Turks, um, that this is the way that we can sort of uh, improve relations between uh, Ankara and Washington. In fact, I think that's potentially quite dangerous um, because we are, uh, the big problem I see with American and Russian policy is that uh, the areas in which America is contesting Russia by and large are not vital interests of the United States, whereas they are very much vital interests of, the, of, of Russia. And you don't have to take my analysis. Uh, you can uh, simply read uh, Robert Gates, uh, former Secretary of Defense, former director uh, under two presidents, former director of the CIA, um, and a, a, a hardline a cold warrior, someone who knows Russia and the Soviet Union extremely well. And that's precisely what he's written in uh, two of his uh, books now that he's out of, uh, been out of policy, um, out of the policy world. Uh, and we saw something of that with uh, the war in Georgia in 2008. And I, again, I won't get into the details there, but that was um, you know, a, a, a war that was begun by an American ally uh, under, for sure, uh, Russian provocation, but the war was begun by uh, Mikhail Saakashvili. And as a result of that war, the United States, it was not by Georgia's side, in fact. Um, and it was quite interesting, you know, Turkey's reaction too, which was to put some distance between itself and Georgia. So my concern, in other words, is that in trying to kind of stir the pot more in Ukraine, uh, that the United States and Turkey might end up repeating essentially what they did in Syria, where they both intervened in Syria and you know, Obama, to his great discredit, um, was not willing, he was willing neither to really intervene to the end, but he was not willing to stay out. He did half and half, which was the absolute worst. He brought Turkey along with that. And I suppose that blame for that goes on uh, the Turks themselves for jumping in with the United States, but it blew up uh, in both their faces. And my concern is that they might end up doing something like that uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and we can look to both you know, the, the place of Syria today, it's, it's an absolute mess. And you know, Ukraine, if you were to go back in 1991 and think, of what is an area of the Soviet Union that will have the most, has the best prospects for a prosperous future, Ukraine probably would have been one of the top because one of the point of its geographic location, not far from Europe, immense natural resources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yet Ukraine is, was and remains a basket case. Um, so to come back, uh, let me just uh, quickly try to answer you know, my uh, expectations for Turkish-American relations for 2021 and, and, and further. 
Uh, I, I agree uh, with uh, the general about, I think that both sides have finally, I hope, put down the shovels and we aren't digging the holes any deeper. And I think that you know, there's a possibility for modestly improved relations between the two, but largely because I think they might find themselves more on the defensive uh, than on the offensive. By that, I mean, um, you, as, as every Turk's well aware, the Turkish lira is continuing to slide against the US dollar. Uh, the Turkish economy is weak. Uh, Turkey's resources are not uh, where uh, Turkey would like to see them. Now, it may be the case that the United States and Turkey are both going to come roaring back after this pandemic. Um, however, there's a lot of concern about the future of the U.S. dollar, both inside the United States, concerns about the uh, potential growth of inflation and what that could, uh, the sort of destabilization that could wreak um, in de American domestic politics, which I don't think anyone should take for granted. I've been uh, quite distressed to see uh, the growth of polarization and instability inside of, uh, of the United States. Uh, it was quite remarkable to be sitting here in Istanbul in January and to watch Turkish uh, news programs in the evening discuss what had happened in Washington, D.C. And so instead of some crazy thing happening in the Middle East or inside of Turkey, there it was watching the Turks discussing what's going, what craziness is going on inside the United States. And I could see that, the, whereas I know these Turkish commentators have gotten quite used to describing and, and discussing crises that are taking place literally on their doorstep, that the fact that they were discussing one in the United States seemed to upset them as well. <laughs> we're, rather than taking any enjoyment in this, it's actually uh, scaring us. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think that's something that any of us can take for granted. What is going to be the future of the U.S. economy and the dollar? Um, and what sort of instability might that wreak uh, you know, globally and uh, at home? So both, I guess, this, so the, what I'm trying to say is that Turkey and the United States might find themselves getting along uh, both of 2021 and beyond for the short term, simply because they're going to both have a lot more problems to deal with and aren't going to have the energy uh, to bicker uh, with each other. And they're going to discover that they need each other uh, more uh, than, than they understood. And particularly, I think we didn't say much about Iran, but you know, Iran's nuclear ambitions uh, has to be a major concern uh, for the United States and especially for Turkey. And you know, incidentally, I think that's one area where the two should be very closely consulting and collaborating. And, uh, you know, I, again, as I said, I'm not uh, at all a fan of any policy of trying to debate the Russian bear. But uh, there, too, there's, there was reasons for uh, Turkey and the United States both to keep a close eye on Russia and try to uh, collaborate with each other. And I think there, you know, uh, Turkey's longer term interests do lie, uh, are closer with the United States for the simple reason that uh, every geography, um, you know, Turkey's security interests, uh, it's easier for the United States to align its security interests with Turkey. Uh, once the United States comes to a clear understanding what its own proper national interests are. Well, I pass the mantle of pessimism to Mike Reynolds. <laughs> I'll accept it. <laughs> we can't hear we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah. We have little time left, sir. I have two questions. And one question to Mr. Mankov. The geopolitical power struggle continues in the Black Sea, Ukraine, Caucasus, Eastern Mediterranean, Syria, and Libya. Mr. Jeffrey, how does this struggle between the USA and Russia affect Turkey? Oh gosh, that's a that's a big <laughs> question. Yes. Um, so I, I think you know this struggle, as you put it, affects Turkey in, in different ways because Turkey is a couple of different things. On the one hand, it's a member of the NATO alliance. On the other hand, it's an aspiring regional power that is seeking to um, develop its own interests and influence in many of the regions that you talked about. And sometimes those interests coincide with those of its NATO partners, and sometimes they don't. Um, and I think that if you think about the Russo-Turkish relationship over the longer term, a lot of explanatory power comes from this duality in the nature of Turkey's interests, that on the one hand, it benefits from having the security guarantees, the political alignment with NATO and with its Western partners. 
On the other hand, as it has developed in the post-Cold War period as an increasingly independent, strategically autonomous regional power, it has sought for ways to develop more room for maneuver for itself. And in doing that, has sometimes uh, sought to work with Russia, um, but has also found itself drawn into these regional conflicts in many places where it's on the opposite side from Russia. Um, and in doing that, it often ends up creating additional difficulties in its relationship with its NATO partners. So I think that this competition, one of the previous speakers talked about the growth of regional powers and the move away from, you know, the bipolar bloc system that existed in the Cold War. I think that's what you're seeing here. You're, you're seeing the transition as the United States rebalances its global force posture, looking more at, at Asia and the Indo-Pacific, um, as there's a greater push for European strategic autonomy, uh, which creates friction within NATO as uh, former imperial powers like Russia and Turkey um, increasingly seek to leverage their ties with, it, with regions that surround their borders. Um, there's a fundamentally new kind of dynamic here where you have a more multipolar, more fluid um, kind of geopolitics where the interests of the different players are more cross-cutting um, than they were perhaps in a previous era. And so I think if you look at the Black Sea, for instance, um, the, the big story in this region over the last decade has been Russia's annexation of Crimea um, and military intervention uh, in Georgia, um, which has dramatically changed the balance of power uh, around the Black Sea. And the reason for the Russian intervention in these places to a significant degree had to do with NATO. Uh, it had to do with concerns that first Georgia and then Ukraine were on a path towards uh, NATO membership and by intervening and disrupting the territorial integrity of these countries um, made it much, much harder for um, them to be given a path towards uh, integration with your Atlantic structures. At the same time, particularly in Crimea, Russia has enormously um, stepped up the militarization of uh, the territory that it's annexed. Um, and so now, you know, you went from having kind of a decrepit uh, post-Soviet Black Sea fleet that was based in Crimea uh, to having a much improved Russian Black Sea fleet uh, that includes anti-ship, uh, anti-aircraft batteries. Um, you've had a build up, a build up of Russian military power uh, along the Russian uh, littoral uh, on the eastern part of the Black Sea. And so today, Russia is by far the strongest military power in the region. And that creates significant problems for Turkey, uh, which in a previous era before 2014 um, enjoyed a much more favorable balance of power. And so I think, you know, for instance, thinking about the, the Turkish-Ukrainian relationship, part of the rationale for that is to try and compensate in some ways for this growth of Russian power um, around the Black Sea. Now, at the same time, I agree with, with Professor Reynolds that this poses significant dangers, both because Russia remains the stronger military power in this region, but also because of the great sensitivity that Ukraine holds for Russia. And Russia's very clearly demonstrated willingness to use military power to uh, defend what it sees as its interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. And so I do think there's a danger um, in Turkey's sort of pursuit of its regional ambitions outside the framework of its NATO partnerships, creating greater complications with Russia and potentially creating a scenario in which um, some kind of accident or some kind of, of conflict is more likely, one that would have implications not just for Turkey, but also for, for NATO as a whole. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a dangerous situation and it's one that you can see playing out in different ways in all of these different regions um, that you talked about. As the number of players multiplies, as the interests between the different players diverge, I think the potential for disagreements, the potential for clashes, the potential for uh, crises only grows. Um, but I think that's the world we're moving into, one in which there is more of this push towards regionalization. There's more friction uh, between regional powers, and it's these seam areas um, in places like Ukraine, the South Caucasus, um, the Eastern Mediterranean, that are really going to be the focal point for these rivalries between aspiring regional powers. Thank you very much. Appreciate, sir. Thanks. And the last question goes to... Mr. Faris Ismailzadeh, 
Uh, a positive cooperation started between Turkey and Russia, as you know, with the Astana process in Syria. Considering the Biden administration, is this cooperation between the two countries sustainable? In other words, does Moscow pursue Turkey as competitor or is it a partner to cooperate with? What is your evaluation, sir? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question and uh, also for a chance to answer the last question. Um, generally, Russian-Turkish cooperation started not with Astana, but much earlier. Uh, even the, some of the energy projects in 1990s, uh, the growing trade, involvement of Turkish companies in some major construction pro projects. And even uh, this year, we saw after a tough competition in South Caucasus, we saw that Turkey and Russia have started cooperating on nuclear uh, power plant. So to, it's, it's, it would be very mistaken way to put uh, Turkey in one of the baskets. Is it with the West or is it with Russia? It's neither. Uh, Turkey is looking for opportunities, for trade opportunities, for economic opportunities. And if such opportunities arise with Russia, Turkey is pursuing them. Um, I don't think that it would be right to say that Turkey is 100% with the West or with NATO. Uh, Turkey does not want to become uh, such kind of appendix to NATO, but Turkey rather would pursue its own national interests. So in that regard, in some areas where the cooperation is possible, such as nuclear power plants or pipelines, energy, uh, transit corridors. Now, let's not forget that in South Caucasus, after the liberation of Karabakh, there will be opportunities for direct, for the first time, direct railway connection between Turkey and Russia uh, via the liberated areas. And uh, this could create a very big transport arteries and transport networks in the region. And Turkey would have access to Central Asia uh, directly. So all these opportunities are opening up and Turkey is pursuing them. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but uh, in the future, I think, Turkey will look for uh, those areas where it can get best benefits uh, from the West and best benefits from the Russian uh, cooperation. That's, that's my assessment. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Faris. Thank you very much. So uh, the president of Istanbul Aydın University is going to make a closing remarks, but because of uh, because the closing remarks just here are the results I found from the panel, from this discussion. A mutually acceptable solution on the S-400 system is unlikely to be found anytime soon. And the issue is set to become a long lasting irritant in the relationship between USA and Turkey. On the Eastern Mediterranean at best, the crisis can be frozen with mutually talks between the two countries plus on the Eastern Mediterranean, we are likely to see more policy coordination between the USA and Turkey in the future. As the USA will continue to support YPG and PKK, as you mentioned during the discussion, terrorist organization in Syria, this will continue to be an important problem area between the two countries. And dear participants, you have provided us with very important and useful information. It was very efficient panel. I would like to thank you for your significant contribution. It is a pleasure to have you here in our university. It has been an honor, an honor for me to be moderator of this event. My respects to all of you. Now, with your permission, I would like to invite the president of Aydın University, Professor, Mr. Mustafa Aydın, to make his closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Naim, and thank you very yeah. much, all the colleagues and the speakers. Uh, I am now in the United States, in San Francisco. I come to uh, San Francisco before three days. Uh, we have this some um, relationship between the Istanbul Aydın University and the uh, universities in the United States. And uh, in the beginning, uh, I had some problem in the related to this panel. 
And if uh, if you do give me the permission, I want to speak the Turkish language. And I want to from my colleague Irem Arman. I think uh, she is now in the panel. Uh, I want. I'm to, here. Uh, I'm here. Yes, the translation from the Turkish language to uh, English language. Thank you very much. Öncelikle böyle güzel bir paneli, böyle değerli konuşmacılarla gündeme getirdiğiniz için başta değerli üniversitemizin değerli öğretim üyesi ve araştırmalar merkezi başkanı Naim Babiroğlu'na ve değerli konuşmacı hocalarımıza, akademisyenlerimize, sivil toplum kuruluşlarının çok değerli temsilcisine çok teşekkür ediyorum. First of all, I would like to thank to our valuable participants and, of course, uh, the organizer of this event, the professor in our university and the chairman of our resource center, Professor Naim Babiroğlu, and all the valuable speakers, the academics, the participants who are now here with us today at this uh, webinar. Thank you. Öncelikle, baştan sona değilse bile büyük bir bölümünü paneli izledim, takip etme imkanı buldum. First of all, not uh, from the very beginning, but I get the chance to listen to most of the panel here with, uh, with you today. Konuşulacak olanları çok değerli katılımcılar e, değerli fikirleriyle, değerli görüşleriyle ortaya koydular. Uh, all the topics were discussed with the valuable opinions and the, the uh, ideas of the uh, valuable participants. E, çok istifade ettik. Dinleyiciler de çok yararlandılar bu panelde. Uh, the, it was very import, informative and it was very beneficial to all the listeners of this webinar. Uh, bir emekli and I am also uh, somewhat a retired uh, military uh, serviceman. Uh, uzun bir süre uh, Mısır'da, uh, Afrika ülkelerinde uh, bir kısımda Avrupa'da olmak üzere askeri atışarlık yaptım. For a long time, I was uh, in the African countries and a little bit in the European countries as a military attaché. Ve 95 yılında emekli oldum. And at 95, I retired. Sonra bu eğitim sektöründe çalışmalara başladım. And then I started working on the education sector. Ben her zaman e, şöyle bir düşüncemi paylaşmak isterim. I always want to share a, a, an idea of mine. Burada da onu söyleyerek e, konuşmamı tamamlamak istiyorum. I want to end my uh, speech with that topic as well. Herkes bu dünyada kendine düşen görevi yerine getirir. Everybody is obliged to do what they have to do in this world. Her kurum kendine düşen görevi yerine getirir. Every institution has to carry out his own responsibilities. Ve her devlette de kendi üzerine düşeni yapar. And every country uh, the, does what they need to do. Bizim ona onu neden öyle yapıyorsun diye kızmak sadece kendimizi hayıflanmaktan öteye bir karımız olmadı işte. Uh, it will be only uh, on our ourselves if we uh, question what that country is doing, what they are doing for. Üzerimize düşen onun neden öyle yaptığını öğrenmek ve ona karşılık gereğini yerine getirerek onun onu yapmasını engellemektir. The, what we have to do is to try to figure out what the, why they are acting the way they do and what we, sh- we should do in terms of that react in uh, that uh, what they do. Politikanın da gerek askeri olsun gerek sivil olsun temel esasını bu teşkil eder. Uh, the uh, fundamentals of the uh, politics is also in military and in politics is, is the same as well. Amerika kendi üzerine düşeni yapıyor kendi çıkarları için. US is doing what they need to do in order to have their own benefits. Türkiye de hakeza kendi üzerine ve kendi çıkarlarını düşünerek yapıyor. Of course Turkey is doing what he needs to do in order to have his own benefits. Aynı şekilde Rusya. It's Russia as well. Dolayısıyla biz bu üçgen içerisinde olması gerekenin bütün halk için, toplum için, bölge için, insanlık için en doğru ve en yararlılığını bulup çıkararak onu hayata geçirmektir. So what we need to do is we have to look at this triangle and see what is the best for the public, for the community and for our own country. Ama Amerika ile Türkiye'nin e, tarihi bu ilişkilerinin zaman zaman kesin diye uğrasa da bunların asla ve asla kopma noktasına geleceğine hep en asla inanmadım. Hiçbir zaman da inanmıyorum. But I personally did never believed and I'm not uh, believing right now as well the 
long history of United States and Turkey relations, although it, it must sometimes have been strained, will never come to a, a, a, a, a point that we don't have any relations. İnişli çıkışlar her ilk ülkenin de belki kendisine çeki düzen vermesini gerektiriyordur o dönemde. Uh, the up and downs of our relationship maybe sometimes makes us consider what we should do uh, in this step forward. Bu her iki ülke için de geçerli. It, it is also the same for both countries. Bu Rusya için de geçerli. And also Russia. Dolayısıyla ben e, hem coğrafi olarak hem stratejik olarak hem e, insan kaynağı hem yeraltı ve yerüstü kaynakları olarak dünyanın en stratejik yerinde bulunan Türkiye'nin e, tarih boyunca asırlarda devam eden bu süreçler içerisinde her zaman ülkeler arasındaki bu diyalog ve ilişkilerde zaman zaman sıkıntılar yaşamıştır ve yaşamaya da devam edecektir. So uh, Turkey uh, with its geo- geographical and strategic position and with its natural resources and all the other aspects of its, con- its country will always have uh, some uh, different relations between various countries and this happened in the past in the uh, in the history and it will happen the same in the future as well. Burada da asli olan doğru politikayı bulup onu hayata geçirmektir. The main thing is to find the right politics to uh, follow and go on with that. Rusya Rusya ile aynı coğrafyada yaşıyoruz. We lived uh, with Russia in the same geography. Birçok ortak değerimiz var. We have very, many common values. E, sınır taşımız aynı zamanda. We have borders as well. Amerika ile uzun süredir bir e, güçlü bir bağlılık kuran bir partnerliğimiz var, bir işbirliğimiz var. Uh, with America, we have a very strong partnership for all through the history and uh, still as well. Hem NATO itibariyle hem ekonomik itibariyle çok güçlü bağlarımız var. We have very strong relations in terms of NATO and in economic aspects as well. Ne oradan tamamen kopmamız mümkündür, ne bu taraftan tamamen kopmamız mümkündür. It's not impossible. It's impossible for us to sever our ties in uh, either way. O hayatın gerçeğidir. This is our reality of life. Türkiye bir Güney Afrika ülkesi veya da bir Güney Amerika ülkesi değil. Turkey is not a, a South America or South Africa country. Etrafında olan veya da bir Asya Pasifik ülkesi de değil. Or a, or an Asia Pacific country. Kendi bulunmuş olduğu coğrafi konuma göre politika üretmek zorunda. We have to generate poli- uh, politics in terms of the region that we live in. Ben e, bütün değerli konuşmacılarımıza bu katkılarından dolayı çok teşekkür ediyorum. Again, I want to thank e, for all the valuable contributions of our participants. Ülkeler arasındaki ilişkilerin daha doğru, daha düzgün, daha insancıl, daha eşit bir şekilde yürüyeceğine katkı sağlayacağına olan inancım tam. I have full confidence that in the future we will have more equal, humane and peaceful relationships with both countries. Bir gerçeği daha vurgulamak istiyorum sizlere söz bitmeden önce. And uh, on my last note I just want to share with you another uh, topic that I want to discuss. Bizler yani sizler politikacılara ve ekonomistlere ışık tutan kişilersiniz, kurumlarsınız. You and I mean us are are the people who will share a light to the politic- politicians. Eğer ışığı güçlü tutarsak o politikacılar da ekonomistler de yollarını doğru görürler. The brighter this light is, the politicians and the economists will have a better path to follow. Eğer ışığı zayıf verirsek, onlar da yanlış işler yaparlar. If the light is not strong enough, then the path will not be clear. Hem kendileri duvara çarpar, hem de temsil ettikleri ülkeyi duvara çarpırlar. They will just uh, hit a wall and they make their own countries hit a wall as well. Onun için bu tür etkinlikler, webinarlar, konferanslar çok çok önemli. That's why these kind of webinars uh, are very important. Hepinize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Again, thank you very much. Koronasız ve sağlıklı günlerde inşallah yüzde bu konferansları yapacağımız günleri bekliyorlar. Hepinize saygılar sunuyorum. I, I, I like to extend my gratitude once again and hope to see you face to face in a healthy corona free days ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Good evening from Turkey. And Mr. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. General, Professor Re- Reynolds, Mr. Faris Maizade, Mr. Jeffrey Mankov, 
Thank you again for your significant contribution to this panel. Hope to see you on another panel. And good evening, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much again, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Teşekkürler. Sağ olun. Görüşmek üzere.